Good morning, everyone. We'll be starting in just a moment, uh, but we want to give a quick moment for everybody to enter the room and kind of get settled. All right, and as I see those numbers starting to slow down a little bit, um, welcome everyone to the IAPP web conference, Rethinking Data Visibility, Why Effective Governance Needs Continuous Discovery, sponsored by Transcend. My name is Marjorie Boyer, and I am a speaker and programming coordinator here at the IAPP. I'll be your host for today's program. We'll be getting started with the presentation in just a minute, but before we do, a few program details. Participating in today's web conference will automatically provide IAPP certified privacy professionals who are the named registrant with one CPE credit. A copy of today's web conference will be available in your My IAPP My Purchases My Recordings panel within 48 hours. Please feel free to post any questions you have for the panelists in the Q&A area at the bottom of the screen. So now on to our program, and I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Phyllis Spang, Marketing Director at Transcend and our panelists, Sean Litchie, marketing pro uh, product marketing at Transcend, and Brandon Weeby, head of privacy and general counsel at Transcend. It's a pleasure to have you folks here and we are looking forward to this conversation. So with that, I will hand it over to our panelists and our moderator. Well, thanks Marjorie. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you may be in the world. Uh, I think folks are still slowly trickling in um, but hi again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Like Marjorie said, my name is Phil Fang, and I'll be moderating today's conversation about rethinking data visibility in 2023. If you are new to us, if you're new to Transcend, we are the platform that helps companies put privacy on autopilot, making it easy to encode privacy across your entire tech stack. We'll also have a special offer to share at the end of this session for those who are interested in learning more about Transcend. So please stick around and keep your ears open for that. All right, so today we'll be talking about data visibility, current challenges in 2023, and specifically why continuous government, uh, sorry, continuous discovery is critical for effective governance. And let me just make sure I am sharing my screen. All right, now we're in business. All right, so again, talking about rethinking data visibility in 2023. And like Marjorie um, introduced at the start, joining me today are Brandon Vivi, Transcend's General Counsel and Head of Privacy, and Sean Lichty, our Product Marketing Manager. Um, so to kick things off, uh, just to give a quick overview of the next hour and what we're going to be covering, We'll start with a bit about why data visibility status quo is no longer enough in 2023 in today's world. We'll spend a beat talking about the many layers of data visibility, what that means in its different shapes and forms. To automate or not to automate, I think this question comes up a lot in modern privacy operations and teams today. So we'll dive into that. And then finally, we'll cover off practical tips for implementing an automated data mapping solution. Oops. Okay, I think we've got um, a good enough quorum of people. So let's just dive into the meat of things. Um, let's get started. So to kick things off, we'd like to actually just run a quick poll. Using the um, polling tool, it should be popping up on your screen. Let us know um, at your company, how often are new data systems being added into your tech ecosystems? Oops, there we go. So again, how often are new data systems being added into your company's tech ecosystem? Is this happening daily, weekly, monthly, or maybe you just don't know? Um, there's a lot of teams, we're all spread out with remote work and a lot of systems and moving parts happening. Well, thanks everyone for participating. Okay, this is super interesting. Um, it looks like out of the 
57 of you all who participated and answered, almost half of you guys are just saying you don't know. That's actually really common of what we've heard from um, our customers and companies that we've talked to. It's, it's really hard to get a full kind of view and landscape across different teams, different um, you know, regions, different business units, brands, what have you, procuring data systems. Um, so that totally makes sense. You're certainly not alone. Weekly and monthly, that's that's like a significant chunk too. And then I think even 5% of you guys said daily. So that's certainly a lot of data changing, a lot of data changing hands um, and definitely helps us paint the picture of the kind of breadth and scope of the um, problem that we're dealing with today. So thanks all for participating in that. Um, I think, all right, cool. Okay, so data is expanding rapidly. We live in this world today where, as you guys all just shared with us, data is expanding rapidly, both in volume and in sprawl. Um, so between 2016 and 2021, in just five years, the amount of data that organizations manage grew from less than 1.5 petabytes to 14.6. That's over a 10x increase, and that is tremendous volume. Um, the sprawl also comes from the velocity at which companies are adding new systems to their tech stack, as you guys just demonstrated for us with this poll. And according to um, Transcend's State of Data Visibility report that we did last year in 2022, 50%, or sorry, 57% of tech leaders surveyed say that new systems containing user data are added weekly and in some cases daily within their companies. So it sounds like the responses that you guys shared today um, fall very much in line with those findings. All right, and then according to that same report from 2022, uh, a staggering two thirds of companies still don't have an accurate or complete picture of the data they hold. Um, I think we see headlines littered, you know, very often in the news with high profile examples of this reality. Uh, when asked in a deposition to relay a list of where personal data might be stored across the 55 different Facebook subsystems, um, Eugene Zarashoff, who's an engineer at Facebook, replied, I don't believe there's a single person that exists who could answer that question. And then they asked him how Facebook might track down all the data associated with a user's account. And he responded, it would take multiple teams on the ad side to track down exactly where the data flows. And that's just one, you know, pretty wild example with the Facebook deposition, but I think uh, many of us see those similar realities in our day-to-day -day, um, in our orgs. All right, so, you know, if we let that sink in, personal data that companies hold is expanding by orders of magnitude, and the majority of organizations still don't have a clear view into where that data is stored and how exactly it's being used. And I think we're all familiar and aware here that regulatory scrutiny has only increased. In the past two years, we saw a 746 million euro fine for Amazon, 405 million euro fine for Instagram, and a 225 million euro fine for WhatsApp. So all of this to say, this is why the status quo on data visibility oops, is no longer enough. Um, all right, so with that backdrop, we'd love to run another quick poll amongst all of us here today. Um, so the second poll question should pop up. And this one we're asking, how much visibility do you have in your role into all the personal data that's collected, stored, and used across your company? Is it less than a quarter, 26 to 50%, a little bit more, or you have over 76% visibility? into all that personal data. We'll give folks a few more seconds to respond. Love seeing these answers trickle in. All right, thanks, Marjorie, for running that poll. And thanks, everyone, for participating. All right, so how much visibility do you have into all personal data collected, stored, and used across your company? About half of you all answered less than 25%. That's 
that's not too much visibility. And so that's, I'm, I'm sure is making, um, you know, later data governance, regulatory compliance harder and, and just keeping us all up at night. And then I think it looks like the rest of us all were split anywhere from 26 to over 76%. So really interesting to see the, the distribution here and the uh, majority kind of sitting in that bottom, bottom quarter. So thank you all for participating in that. All right, so we've set the stage um, on the increasing data volume, data sprawl, the general kind of lack of cohesive data visibility. I'd love to bring on Brandon and Sean um, to start for, to start uh, just kicking off our conversation here in our discussion. Brandon, starting with you, could you share a bit more on why better data visibility has become so critical in these recent years? Yeah, absolutely, Phyllis. And uh, thanks for moderating. And Sean, um, thanks for participating today. Excited to talk about this. Um, I always enjoy spending some time talking about the purpose of data visibility and the data mapping exercise uh, generally, um, because it's a bit different from some of the other compliance activities that we're usually engaged in as privacy practitioners. Uh, in many cases, a lot of what we spend our time focused on are activities that are expressly required by the applicable regulations. Um, for example, uh, when we're uh, working on drafting our data processing agreement templates or drafting privacy notices on our websites or standing up a process to intake and respond to data subject access requests or delete requests, um, each of those kind of has a direct corresponding um, regulatory antecedent tied to it, right? So we can go into the regs and, and see that that is required and that is why we're spinning up that task. And a lot of us, you know, focus on those because we're resource limited and, uh, and we need to just check the biggest boxes and take a risk-based approach to privacy. Um, data mapping, with some limited exceptions, is a little bit different in that it doesn't always have this direct antecedent. Um, I think it's important to think of it as a prerequisite for almost every other privacy requirement that a modern organization has to deal with. Um, and I'll give just a handful of examples of where having a data map uh, is really a prerequisite in order to get to full compliance. Uh, the first example is anywhere that a business has that disclosure notice, a privacy disclosure notice, um, on the type of data that it's processing uh, and why it's processing that data. Many privacy regimes require organizations to disclose the type of data that they're processing um, uh, through a privacy policy at the point of collection uh, or, or even in a DPA uh, if you're processing on behalf of a controller. Um, and the only way the drafter of that notice or that DPA is really going to be able to articulate what data has been processed or is going to be processed by the organization is to have done a comprehensive data mapping exercise to know what systems you have and, and where your data is. Um, there's obligations under uh, privacy regimes around responding to data subject requests, um, access requests, delete requests. If you're going to be able to stand up a process and accurately respond to those requests, the only way you can do that um, is by knowing where the information uh, that you're processing is actually located, and then being able to go into your systems and, and perform that operation against that data. Um, unless you're planning on doing sort of manual search and look up every time you receive a DSAR, you really have to have this map in place um, uh, at the outset. Um, another example is any requirements under regulations that are triggered uh, based off of the specific type of data that you're processing. So in the US, there's a variety of new uh, state laws, including uh, CCPA as amended by CPRA, that have specific requirements uh, if you are processing sensitive personal information. Um, and uh, then there's a whole host of sectoral privacy obligations for things like health data or um, financial data. Well, the only way you're going to know if those are triggered by um, uh, the data that you're processing is to actually have done a data map and identify, uh, are we holding sensitive personal information? Are we processing that? Uh, and this is true for really any gap analysis uh, where you're looking at new regulations that are being passed and you're going to have to compare that to the data footprint you actually have. Um, and then of course, there are some very direct requirements 
uh, the things we typically think about first when we're uh, uh, deciding to spin up a data mapping exercise that are required under the law. Uh, most notably is uh, GDPR's Article 30 requirement uh, to maintain records of processing uh, activities. And that ROPA is really a distillation of a data map. But I think uh, across the board, regardless of the type of uh, privacy regulation you're trying to comply with, the step one, the foundational step uh, in getting to compliance is to start with really clear visibility of where your data is. And that requires a data mapping exercise. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon, for taking us through the whole kind of breadth of that. So we know data visibility is critical for compliance in all the ways that you just walked us through. But Sean, if we go a level deeper, how exactly does data visibility enable better data governance? Well, and that's the crux of it right there, right, is that visibility is just, it's the starting point. It's a super important foundational starting point, but visibility alone um, doesn't get you to compliance. Um, it's, it's the foundation that helps get you there. Um, so to really effectively leverage a data mapping um, program that you've stood up, you need to be able to seamlessly move the data that you've discovered into compliance workflows and governance workflows. So let's look at a practical example, right? You need, um, you need the ability, as Brandon just referenced, to set up um, DSAR workflows on all of the discovered and mapped data. Um, it's not enough to know that you have personal data sprawled across 64 different systems and being used by X number of teams across your company. You need to be able to go in programmatically when a, when a DSAR comes in and say, hey, we now know exactly where all that data is, um, which in, in some ways is a burden, right? Because now we need to be able to effectively delete or securely pull down and zip up and ship off an access request to that end user. Um, so the, the best approach to data mapping is to not approach it as a separate ex exercise from governance and compliance, but to approach it as part of the same issue, which is that ideally the, the process that you're using to discover and gain visibility is also going to um, enable your governance and power your governance. Um, additionally, in addition to the more explicit forms of governance like DSAR processing, there's also the governance of just controlling access and usage. So understanding, you know, if, if X data analytics team shouldn't be able to access Y types of data for these certain purposes because it was collected um, and with a disclosed intent for um, processing for business purposes, and now they're looking at using it for product development and advertising purposes, you know, you need to be able to um, identify those sorts of scope creep because it's not just data sprawl itself, it's also scopes for all that often happens when data is repurposed and used um, for different, uh, different things than it was originally intended at the time of collection. Um, so you need to be able to have kind of these robust um, access controls and governance controls so the good news, though, is that obviously technology has come a long way since um, you know 2018 when GDPR came into force, or even 2020 um, with CCPA. Um, so the kind of the initial answers of that's impossible or that's borderline impossible, really hard to do. We still basically need to just be conducting surveys and and trying to cover our butt enough with with enough due diligence to say that we're trying. Um, luckily, the the landscape has really really changed in terms of what's possible um, to get that visibility. Um, and not just at not just at a top level of you know let's okay let's go to procure, procurement and let's let's make sure that we know what systems are getting onboarded, but really at a deeper level to power those governance flows I was just talking about where you have to understand at the field level how is this data actually being used in our company. Yeah, that's that's fantastic news that just you know the tools and technology have shifted to make this more possible. But that's also a great segue, Sean. Can you tell us a bit more about the different levels of data visibility? that you mentioned earlier and how those relate to compliance. Yeah, definitely. I think we have a great, yeah, this visual is a great way because I know that it can, um, you know, trust me, I, I, I work doing this and my eyes can glaze over sometimes when we start talking about the different terminology flying around. So I really love this visual here. So it starts over at the left and, and the highest level and, and maybe the, the type of data mapping um, most you're familiar with is, is at a system level or a data silo level. Um, so, so what are the different um, systems, whether that's a database, um, an internal data bucket of some sort, a SaaS tool where, where personal data is being stored, examples might be Salesforce, um, Redshift, um, Google Cloud Platform, and even things like your email marketing platform and tools that our employees are using to message and manage customer tickets. Um, basically, every, every system that you can think of, or as, as Phyllis 
um, tongue in cheek reference earlier, every system that keeps you up at night wondering what's in there, that's that's all the systems at this level. Um, now these silos are continuously changing, of course, right? You know, every time someone in marketing decides they're gonna whip out their credit card for the free trial of a new marketing tool, or um, you know, a lot of times it's easy to to hope that everything goes through procurement, but we know that's not the case, and we know lots of vendors get um, onboarded all the time. So having a good a good view at the system level is is that kind of crucial first step and this is where a lot of the early kind of first generation data mapping approaches focused uh, back in 2018 when everyone was just kind of scrambled to try to understand what what article 30 actually meant and how they needed to um have have some level of visibility that's where we kind of started you move over to the middle section and now we're talking about data point or data field discovery so that's going into the tools that we're talking about the data systems we're talking about and actually understanding the fields inside them um, now, this can be um, kind of a, a fixed schema. This could be, for example, where it's a it's a known tool, and we kind of know generally. Um, okay, it's um, you know it's uh, it's something like um, thinking of a good example off to my head. It's something like Salesforce, and there's there's a known set of fields kind of that come out of the box. But then there's a lot of times also custom fields. Um, so it changes a lot. And suddenly, you know, you decide to start um, your sales team decides to start cold calling, and a um, a phone number field is added, and suddenly you have a new data point or data field inside that system. So that's the data point discovery level. The third one is the classification level. So that's actually understanding what each field is, assigning it a data type. So it's one thing to have the visibility to say, we have this field called product user ID 44, but what does that field actually represent? Is it tied to an individual's identity? Is it tied back? Um, can it be resolved as a piece of personal data? Um, maybe there's an unlabeled field, um, but that field contains social security numbers and needs to be tagged and flagged as containing social security numbers, even though the database is an unlabeled field. Um, so classifications are possibly even the most dynamic um, out of out of all of these categories, um, and it it changes a lot depending on how um, on how fields are used, but also how they're repurposed um, for net new purposes. So each of these each of these levels is increasing in complexity and granularity, but each of these is is also crucial um, because at the end of the day, unmapped data um, and data that's unclassified is inherently ungovernable. You can't govern something if you don't know it's there, if you can't see it, if you can't understand how it's being used. Um, so if you just stop over at the far left and assume that um, you know an out of the box configuration is being used or just kind of, oh, well, well, that vendor just isn't being used in that way. And you don't actually go probe um, every single day. Um, you know, Clients turn on data mapping and are like, holy cow, people are dropping things in the ticket comments. They've added a random column off to the right side and they're dropping in personal notes saying that so-and-so's mother died and here's a social security number that they need to remove from the account. And you know, you'll know, you find all sorts of data that's sprawled within these systems. So going the, the extra deeper levels to go down to the field level and classify the data um, is, is really, really crucial. Yeah, that's a great overview. Sean, you touched on custom data types a bit earlier. Can you talk a bit more about why companies might need a data map that that you know proactively is set up to catch and classify these custom data types within their business? Yeah, um, definitely. If if you look at this and you you think through, um, you know, depending on what your current data mapping process looks through, it it probably becomes very clear that as you go over to the right, this gets harder and harder to do in a conventional or kind of first generation manual way. Um, there, there just isn't a way to keep a spreadsheet that that classifies every field that's being used across your company, um, at least not in a way that that allows you to remain sane and within your budget. Um, there, there's just too much data flying around. And again, this is where it, it ties back nicely to what I referenced earlier, which is that luckily um, the technology um, has kept up um, and there are there are much better ways than just trying to go in and do like a quarterly survey, which everyone rolls their eyes at and just tries to click through as quick as they can um, to say that, you know, oh yeah, 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 we're just doing the same thing with the data that we were doing when you asked us three months ago. Um, but to actually proactively go in um, and understand um, and map the data in an automated way um, is pretty much the only way that it's feasible given the sprawl. You talked about that 10X sprawl earlier. So now we're, we're talking about classifying data at the petabyte scale. Um, so complying with this with these modern li laws takes modern technology. Um, the regulators are, are hesitant to explicitly say that, but that's really the only answer given the requirements that are laid out in the law and the sprawl of systems and data that we have. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, well, thanks for taking us through the layers of data visibility. Certainly no small feat. Um, and you did bring up the automate word earlier. So I'm curious to hear from folks here at the webinar today. Um, we'll kick off our third poll, but let us know how do you currently map and classify data across your data systems? How, you know, through the layers that Sean just talked through, is it a manual approach? Is it an automated tool? Do you rely on a mix of both? We're just curious with what um, folks today are, are doing and how you guys are tooling against this, this um, massive <laughs> problem. All right, we've got 40 answers. Okay, cool. Thanks all for um, participating in that. One person, one brave person out of the 40 say that they are relying on an automated uh, method to map their data. So that's that's um, great news. Uh, I just feel like this poll is a perfect, a perfect breakdown of the landscape right now, Phyllis. Yeah. You, you still see that, um, you know, about half of people are still fully manual, but there's this movement towards trying to trying to recognize that it's not sufficient anymore and, and bring in a mix. Um, and I think Brandon's going to talk about this more in a minute, but it's it's totally, totally, totally feasible in the right approach to to start taking steps that direction. Don't it's easy to to kind of get yourself stuck in, in thinking this has to be an all or nothing problem and that gets overwhelming really quickly. But um, finding those wins to start moving this direction um, can be really, really valuable. Yeah, definitely. It's it's great to see this breakdown. And I think, Sean, you nailed it on the head. It's not, you know, one or the other. It's not black or white. And it's awesome to see folks in here, um, you know, migrating towards a mix. So you introduce, you cue that up perfectly. But Brandon, um, this might sound like an easy one, but is there a quote unquote right way to approach data mapping? How should companies be thinking about this? Yeah, it, it's an incredibly important question. And I think the poll is, is super revealing. Um, to, to your point and Sean's point, uh, there are several ways to go about the data mapping process and the right way, uh, whether it's automated or manual, is really going to be context specific and it's going to depend on your business uh, and it may end up being a mix of both. Um, one way to approach data mapping is a more manual process uh, where you need to go around and identify the different data silo owners in your business and then actually ask them you know, this long series of questions. What data are they processing? How do they collect it? Who did they collect it from? Um, does it include personal information? All of these sort of uh, data silo identification, uh, data field identification and classification steps that Sean talked about, you have to do through um, a, a human-based survey approach. Um, and, uh, and so that's uh, one way to, to go about and build that system um, and that map. Um, for businesses that may not be processing a lot of data or may not feel like they are likely to be targets of regulatory scrutiny by um, European regulators or the CPPA or the FTC, uh, we've seen the FTC ramp up recently, um, this manual process may be sufficient um, or it may be sufficient in part uh, supplemented by something that's more automated. Um, Another option to perform a data map is to use an automated tool or service. And this could be something that you build in house. Um, it could be an offering provided by a vendor like Transcend. Um, but in either case, uh, the solution ideally would have a way of programmatically identifying new data silos that are added and then actually going into those data silos and uh, reading schema and classifying both structured and unstructured data within those systems um, on a programmatic fashion in real time um, to generate a data map. Um, having this automated system removes the burden from uh, a team or an individual uh, to go around and actually perform surveys. Um, it, it takes less time to get to value because it's always um, automated and, and programmatic. Um, and it's gonna stay updated over time as new systems get added. A manual method uh, has a much lower barrier to entry uh, and depending on the context for your business or your organization, that may be the best way to go to get started and begin to at least get a handle on where data is. Um, it, I, I think if you're a business that has not done a data map yet or you're thinking about refreshing your data map, some good questions to ask yourself when you're trying to uh, get started are things like, 
How often are new systems added to your business that could be processing data? Um, how rigorous is the process for procuring new tools? So one method to manage new tools that come in is through uh, a vendor procurement process. And I know a lot of organizations historically have done this. Uh, and if you have a really robust procurement team, that may be one way um, to, uh, or that may be a system you can leverage to make sure that when these new systems get added, uh, you uh, are, are taking a step to add them to your data map and classify the data that comes in. Um, another question that you could ask yourself is how often are new data processing activities added? So if you're working with the same tool or vendor or system, but you're adding a new use case for processing data um, that you've already collected from data subjects, um, if you're in an organization where this is happening really frequently and you need visibility into those changes, uh, a manual process is going to be more difficult uh, to pick those up because um, the lift of going through a manual data mapping process means that you're probably only going to do it once or, or maybe twice a year. Um, and then uh, the last question could be, um, do you believe your organization has grown past the point where relying on informal or institutional knowledge of data processing uh, is not going to be sufficient anymore? Um, for many young or small organizations, the amount of data, process, data processing activities that are occurring might be knowable by only a few folks in the organization. Um, and at that stage, it's probably reasonable to rely on a manual process and let that small team of folks provide you the information to help keep your data map up to date. But for organizations, um, you know, like the quote that, that Phyllis read earlier from Facebook, where there is such significant data system sprawl and really high volumes of data that are growing rapidly, relying on institutional knowledge uh, particularly if you are, are an organization that is experiencing team turnover, um, it just might, might not be reasonable to rely entirely on a manual process. Um, but to, to Sean and Phyllis's point, I think uh, if you are in the manual stage of this uh, and you're looking to migrate, it's okay to do it in steps and uh, work on uh, the easiest to lift portion of the process first uh, and then slowly become more automated over time. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for that, Brandon. I think that's great news. You know, there's always kind of uh, layers to, to go through um, and to work against. Okay. But let's say that you've decided your organization would benefit from an automated, automated data mapping solution. You know, whether that's the first kind of layer of the onion or going really deep. Um, once you've made that decision, what now? What's the next first step, how practically should you kind of go about that process? Sean, maybe you can take us through a bit more um, of kicking off an automated data solution, data mapping solution. Yeah, definitely. Um, data mapping is is inherently a, a collaborative exercise. It, it has to be. So the, the, first, the first tip I, I think I would have is you just have to work towards cross-functional ownership and, and buy-in. Um, so, you know, you're, you're going to need this sort of support no matter what sort of data mapping workflow you're trying to, um, trying to build towards. Now, certainly manual methods, um, you know, the, the more classic, let's, let's send out a survey and, and get everyone to contribute into a spreadsheet are 100% dependent on, on really, really robust cross-functional ownership. But even the more automated methods, um, you're going to want to, if, if only for the sake of, um, of support and awareness, you're going to want to be looping in. Um, other data stewards and um, processors within your organization. Um, so again, whether that's with a manual method or with an automated method, consider um, every department that's going to need that is within the purview that's going to have relevant data processing activities um, and, and start building those relationships, um, talking about the, the processing activities they have, loss, lawful basis they're working under and, and what, if any, visibility they have um, currently. Um, and that can really help as you start to build a case um, to, to set up a new process and, and potentially um, associated budget as well. Um, it can help you build that really robust case to say, you know, look, I've talked to um, a number of different stakeholders across the company. Um, you can loop them into conversations. You can, you can have their support and buy-in once they understand what you're trying to achieve um, and how ultimately it's going to benefit them as well. A lot of times we see these um, leaders and stakeholders in other departments like engineering um, who, who end up having a, um, 
a really, really big upside um, from the visibility. Um, they don't have the same compliance interest in the data, um, but there can be um, huge budget savings. There can be huge um, process improvements that come from, from understanding duplicate data and workflows that are, um, you know, that are need needlessly convoluted across the org. Um, so I think that as you start to have these conversations and share what you're looking to do, you're going to find a lot more interest than you might anticipate. Um, and of course, from a budget perspective, um, this, this source of cross-functional um, relationship building can really help as well. Um, it's, it's very common to see an, an IT or security or an edge team um, come on as, as partners um, because they, they ultimately recognize the value they're going to get out of this. Um, and that can be a great way um, to help you modernize your privacy program overall. Um, because if you're if you're looking for and selecting a vendor who's not only going to help, like I talked about earlier, who's not only going to help with visibility, but also with governance, like you're automating your DSAR workflows, now you're potentially at a place where you're you're getting budget support cross functionally um, to buy a software that's ultimately going to improve your entire privacy program, um, not just your data visibility piece. Um, so a great way to to get more buy in and improve your program. Um, when you're building these these relationships and considering cross-functional ownership, definitely also um, consider the engineering bandwidth that's going to be required for whatever approach you're taking. Um, and and this can vary not even just between automated versus manual as as a binary question, but there's there's definitely a lot of gradients um, even within the vendor space. Um, so make sure you understand what actually is going to be required. Is this going to be a huge engineering lift with um, you know, deploying new hardware and servers and, and maybe even vendor forward deployed engineers or something that's very involved, um, or is this a lighter weight out of the box integration that can be set up in a couple hours? Make sure you understand that so that you're, you're adequately setting expectations and can get the right level of buy-in. Um, also consider ways that you can meet um, your internal data users where they are um, rather than adding more process and friction to their workflows. Um, so, so what do I mean by that? A lot of times um, I, I know and I think you all know that the privacy can be viewed as a bottleneck. Um, it's it's a hurdle to jump. It's something that slows teams down. It slows down growth. It's like we've we've all heard it. Um, and the good news is, again, because because of of uh, the advances that we've seen in the ways um, our ability to to kind of map and govern data have improved so much over the past couple of years, that doesn't have to be the case um, anymore. Um, and you can you can really try to have a collaborative partnership rather than being a bottleneck. Um, so, for example. Um, consider tools that are able to integrate into your engineers and product developers um, workflows directly, where they're not having to go and, and log in to a separate privacy program or open a separate privacy worksheet and, and kind of conform to the way that you think about the data, um, but look for tools that have um, code base integrations, or um, you may have heard of like infrastructure as code, like a Terraform integration, something where um, your engineering teams can really seamlessly in the environment they're used to working in just declare, hey, um, right in my code, I'm going to declare I'm using this new data type for this new purpose. This is the purpose of processing um, and, and that have that instantly sync into your view. And now you're piggybacking on workflows they're already familiar with and you're getting the visibility that you need to effectively govern that data, but you're not adding a lot of friction to what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, those sorts of um, distinctions can make a really big difference um, when, when you're getting buy-in from other leaders. Oh, and I, I will mention one more thing. The last thing I'll say is that um, we, we talked about your kind of your cross-functional buy-in, um, but also don't forget, obviously, about leadership support. Um, in that 2022 um, data visibility report that we did that Phyllis mentioned, um, I think about 60% of respondents said that that lack of leadership support was, was one of the ultimate reasons that they were unable to create the data mapping program they were looking for. Um, you know, executives, um, Executives don't need to be um, the bottleneck and the, the, the wall here. Um, in fact, they can be some of the biggest champions. Again, just like with building cross-functional relationships, it's all about educating and helping them understand the value that you can bring with this program. Um, and ultimately, a lot of times we're seeing more and more executives are being pressured to answer data privacy questions all the way up the, to the board reporting level. Um, into, the, into the public company's 10K filings, we frequently see um, privacy re reference and privacy challenges reference. So, when you um, when you approach this from an ROI standpoint and start um, laying out the benefits that this can bring, I know um, we actually at, on our website have a great ROI uh, data mapping ROI calculator that you can kind of use to to make this case to your leadership and lay out um, the benefits and the visibility they're going to get, um, but also cost savings from reducing redundant infrastructure, um, cloud server computing costs. Like there's there's a lot of upsides for leadership as well. Yeah, Sean. Thanks for that. And I'm glad you brought up that. Um, there was that slide. Oh, sorry. 
Okay. Sorry, there was a slide for it. I, I, I jumped ahead of you. No, no, you're good. You're good. Um, but I was just going to say, like, you just brought up a really great point about, you know, making that case, whether that is to cross-functional teams, whether that is to leadership at the C-suite level, the board level. Um, so curious, Brandon, with your depth of experience in this field, what metrics do you think can help folks in making that case and making that case compelling? Yeah, um, it, it's one of the biggest challenges for privacy teams is to put together a really compelling case for leadership. And to piggyback on what Sean was saying, I think when you're putting together um, your, uh, your case for investing in data mapping, just like any other uh, uh, privacy initiative that your organization is undertaking, it's important to start with a strategic vision for your privacy org and tie that vision to your company's overall values and goals. Um, uh, as privacy professionals, you know, we often think in terms of risk and harm mitigation, and those things are often not high level company goals for a year. Most companies don't have you know, a top level a goal of getting sued less, for example, or uh, uh, fewer enforcement actions. Um, but for any risk mitigation activity that you're engaged in, there's usually some corresponding opportunity that you can articulate. Um, so for example, does your company have a broad initiative related to customer experience, trust, and success? Um, in the B2C context, that trust relationship uh, is tied directly to your organization's brand. And uh, if you can improve customer satisfaction through a better privacy experience, um, or uh, by updating and clarifying your privacy notice, or confidently fulfilling data access requests, um, those can all have a hugely positive impact on customer experience. And each of these is built off of um, uh, having a comprehensive, accurate, up-to-date data map in place. Um, another example in the B2B context is to look at how many times customers are asking your company about your privacy practices, or uh, how many times have they wanted to negotiate a DPA. Um, if you're running up against customers that are uncomfortable signing up for your service because you can't agree to things like the ability to delete all of the data that you're holding uh, on their behalf, well, that's definitely a regulatory risk and there uh, are harm reduction reasons to engage in that. Uh, but it's also costing you business, it's costing you deals. Um, and a comprehensive data map is going to be foundational to drafting better DPAs that are compliant um, with the regulations and being able to effectively delete data on behalf of a controller that you're serving. Um, so if you're able to tie data mapping investment to these types of privacy activities, uh, you're probably going to be more successful in bringing leadership along. Uh, to answer you know, your question, Phyllis, specifically, there are some discrete metrics that you can look at to support uh, this case. Uh, some quick examples would be the number of DPAs that you're negotiating, the value of the deal tied to those DPAs, um, the number of privacy inquiries that you're getting from customers that led to a deal that you won or a deal that you lost, and look at what the uh, size of those deals were. So now you're starting to move from the reduction to some discrete um, uh, uh, revenue that you've either gained or lost because you had an effective privacy program in place. Um, you can also look at metrics that are causing uh, resource drain on your business due to the absence of a data map. So some examples would be um, the costs of uh, res responding to third-party audits, um, the cost of having to fill out Im data impact assessments, um, or uh, the burden that your team has in processing data access requests. If a more comprehensive or effective data map is going to reduce costs there, then you can actually quantify what that cost reduction is and use that to help justify a, a data mapping investment. And I'd say when you're doing that exercise, don't just look at resource draws on your own privacy team, but look at how current processes are costing other teams times, like your customer success team. Um, if they're fielding DSARs manually, or they have a hard time responding to those because you don't have a full data map uh, or complete data visibility, you know, what's the time impact of that? And does your strategic vision for your privacy program and your budget request 
uh, for, for a data uh, mapping investment actually help ease the burden on those teams. Yeah, that's super helpful. So looking at drain on teams, looking at impact to business and dollars and bottom line. Um, and of course, I think we'd be um, remiss to talk about privacy metrics without considering the costs of non-compliance itself. Brandon, can you expand a bit on that? Sure. So, you know, as we discussed, if a data map is out of date or incomplete uh, or potentially non-existent, it's going to make it much, much more difficult to reach a state of full regulatory compliance. And one of the biggest challenges with manual data mapping is the risk of generating a map that is only partially complete because you're relying on individuals to gather knowledge rather than looking at system level truth. Um, and the risk of generating a data map that grows rapidly stale uh, increases when you're in engaged in that more manual process. And this presents real risk of non-compliance because uh, you may not be able to respond to DSARS fully and effectively. Um, you may not uh, uh, be able to fully disclose the entire scope of your data processing uh, within your privacy policy. Um, and, uh, and in the case, um, uh, in that case in particular, you may not be properly regulating consents um, and opt outs across the full spectrum of your systems because you just don't know what you have uh, in place. Um, as to the consequences of this non-compliance, uh, I probably don't need to go through and cite you know, all of the regulatory enforcement activity under GDPR. Um, you know, we cited to a few of those uh, fines uh, earlier in the, in the slide deck, but uh, you, know, you can go to enforcementtracker.com and look at all of the different GDPR violations uh, based off of the, um, uh, the data protection authority that was in charge of that and see where those violations occurred um, some of them have uh, occurred just for not having a ROPA in place, but I think each of those we can tie directly to um, uh, a, a better data map and better internal data visibility would have helped mitigate the risk there. Um, I will call out that in one enforcement action that we've had, the one enforcement action we've had that has arisen in California, one of the issues the Attorney General's office pointed to in the Sephora case was uh, Sephora's incomplete privacy notice with respect to data selling and sharing. And so uh, these types of non-compliance activities are definitely on the radar um, of regulatory agencies. And I think as we go through the year and we see US enforcement begin to ramp up, um, uh, especially when the CPPA begins to enforce on July 1st, we're gonna get a lot more clarity on, on what the um, downside impact could be for organizations that are not in full compliance. Yeah, definitely. I think you're right. Um, as we get closer to that July 1st enforcement date, we'll certainly see more pop up um, over on the side, in the California side of the, uh, of the ocean. All right. This was um, an awesome overview. Thank you, Sean and Brandon. Um, as we wrap up, I just want to flick it back over to you guys if you have any closing thoughts to leave the group here with. Maybe Sean. No, I would. First. Okay. Yeah, no, I'd love to. I'd love to get into Q and A. I always feel like that's where some of the meatiest the closing thoughts. Yeah, definitely. Come from, but I, I've, I've loved this conversation. Yeah, that's a great um, reminder. So, folks, please use the Q and A chat um, if you have a question about something that we walked through earlier. If you have a question about something just kind of within the data mapping or automated data mapping um, world, please drop them in. Um, and as we wait for more questions. Brandon, any closing thoughts from you to share with the group? Yeah, I would say um, just really quickly, you know, every year we say that this is uh, going to be the year of privacy and the statement continues to be true every single year. Um, if you're an organization that's on the fence about um, kicking off a more robust data mapping project, um, it's really hard to think of a better time uh, to get started than, than right now. Um, particularly for U.S. organizations that are new to complying with um, generally applicable privacy laws, um, as, as CPRA enforcement begins to ramp up a bit more, uh, now is the best time to, uh, to get your ducks in a row and begin to get organized. Um, and uh, there's, there's really no better first step than beginning to build a, a, robust, or a robust data map to kick off those compliance work streams. Well, cool. thanks, Brandon. 
All right, and thanks folks for um, the questions. Let's get into some of the Q&A. So we have a question here about how does automated data mapping work if your company doesn't have a dedicated team of engineers to help set up and maintain the technology? I think this is a super relevant question. I know, um, you know engineering resources tend to be limited and, and that's not a uncommon problem. So I'm sure folks are facing this um, beyond the one person who asked the question. Sean, do you want to take us through a bit of this since you did talk about, you know, meeting engineers where they're at? Talk us through how yeah. automated data mapping could work here. Yeah, we, we definitely get this a lot. Um, I think the good news is that the, the engineering lift to implement an automated, automated data mapping system doesn't have to be what it what it used to be. Um, there are a lot of um, a lot of API integrations and, and ways to do this in a in a much lighter way. Um, I think what I would say is that um, try before you buy. Um, if if your vendor is is going to let you see what that lift is, that's a great sign that it's not going to be too bad. Um, a lot of times, if something's going to be really complicated, that's going to wait until after after the ink is dry on the paper and you've kind of bought. And unfortunately, that can kind of um, lead to these situations where there's shelfware that that was bought and and it's great on paper, but it's really hard to implement. Um, so I would say make sure that you're doing really robust um, discovery during kind of the, the vetting process to say, okay, how much lift is this actually going to take? Can we can we try setting up a couple of these integrations and see how hard it is and, and see what sort of results we get from doing that? Um, so get a feel for it, but I would just say that the, the lift doesn't have to be as, as, as extensive as it used to be. Um, and a lot of times, um, again, like we referenced earlier, if you're being intentional about choosing something that's going to help with your governance workflows, as well as your discovery workflows, you're kind of getting two for one here, um, with also automating the, the data subject request portions as well. Um, so, uh, long story short, um, it, it can be it can be relatively easy to implement, um, but uh, that can vary a lot. Um, so just take the time to, to make sure you understand um, what the lift is going to be for the solution you're looking at. Cool, cool. Thanks. That's good news. Um, we have another question from Liliana. So thanks, Liliana, for dropping this in. What do you think about having internal audit representatives participate in the data inventory process? Brandon, yeah, take us yeah. I can speak to this um, uh, briefly. I think it is going to be business uh, specific and context specific. Um, so ultimately when you're kicking off a data mapping exercise, I think you need to start with why you're doing it. What are the goals you're trying to accomplish when you are putting a data map into place? As we talked about early on, um, you know, data mapping is a foundational step to achieve compliance in a whole bunch of uh, discrete and more specific areas. Um, but it's really that that first step that you have to take. So to the extent that you can accomplish that with uh, internal audit representatives as part of that process, I think that's fine. I think the other question to ask, and this is much more business specific, and it depends on um, your, your data processing risk, your regulatory risk, is, um, uh, is the way that you're performing internal audits subject to attorney-client privilege? Is that something that once you've done a gap analysis, you feel confident that you're going to be able to remediate and um, and uh, and mitigate that risk. And uh, so you you should probably be talking with your internal privacy counsel or external counsel uh, on this and and uh, making sure that however you approach that auditing process, you're being thoughtful about what you're going to do with the end of end result that you get from that, um, and and what the next step is to. Uh, build fully robust uh, compliance regimes in your in your um, in your business. Cool, thanks, Brandon. That's super helpful. Um, have a question. Have another question here. That's sort of within that realm. So, if the security team in my company already "quote unquote" owns data mapping, how should I go about getting a seat at the table? Yeah, I'll I'll kick that off, and then Sean, if you have any thoughts, um, uh, would love to hear that too. Um, I think it goes back to the way that you're um, trying to make a case for privacy across your organization overall. Uh, and, uh, and as we discussed earlier, tying your privacy organization's initiatives to broader strategic visions for your business is going to um, allow you to leverage 
other teams' resources and um, uh, the work that other teams are doing to accomplish that. Um, it's going to elevate the value that, that your team is bringing to the organization overall. And getting leadership buy-in is, is one way to do that. Um, but I think if you're in the situation where your security team is already owning the data inventory process um, and the data mapping process, you're in a really good spot because you can work closely with them. Uh, and, and those teams are often very tightly integrated into the engineering teams um, to build that cross-functional support sort of out of the gate. Um, you know, Sean was talking about the, the lift that goes into building that cross-functional support before you kick off these projects. If another team is already largely in charge of this um, and, and you can uh, get a seat at the table, uh, you've already accomplished so much more than um, starting from a blank slate. Um, I don't know, Sean, do you have any, any thoughts on that too? No, I think, I think that's a great, uh, I think that's a great answer. And I think that having, um, having privacy on board, having additional stakeholders on board is, is a net positive for the security team as well. It brings different viewpoints. It brings um, a lot of times um, uh, on the privacy side, we already have existing relationships and processes in place that we can leverage to help um, with a security data mapping initiative. So it really is a, a, a classic win-win um, situation for both teams. So, so hopefully it shouldn't be too hard to, um, to go about getting into that process. Awesome. Um, we also hear, we have a question here and we hear about this often, I think on with the companies that we talk to, but any recommendations on how to approach unstructured data within this data discovery, data governance space? Um, I know this is a hot topic and, and definitely a fuzzier problem. So maybe Sean, Brandon, yeah. whoever wants to kick it off, we can share some thoughts around um, recommendations around unstructured data. Sure. Yeah, def definitely a classic. And, and just a quick quick definition and quick level set for those who are going un unstructured. What, what are we talking about here? Um, the unstructured data versus structured data. Structured data is basically data that has um, a more rigidly defined format um, or schema, as it's sometimes called. So structured data is something, um, the easiest way to think about it is kind of your conventional table and row where um, the data is defined um, in, in that sort of a way. Unstructured data is um, classically things like Freeform text, um, messages, emails, um, documents. It's it's things that don't follow a, a predetermined um, data schema or data structure. Um, and it can be a lot harder to um, classify. Um, overall, I think it's um, it's certainly not a type of data you can ignore. Um, it's it's somewhere that personal data often is is found and lives, um, particularly with um, some of the some of the areas regulators are pushing more and more, like employee DSA requests now with CPRA in California, um, a ton of employee data is generated in unstructured formats, um, documents, emails, internal Slack messages. Um, so I think it's absolutely something you should be asking about during um, during the process of building your data mapping um, solution um, and in vendor conversations if, if that's something that's going on to understand. Um, again, re repeating this thing, but again, not only what is there from a visibility standpoint. Um, but governance is particularly um, important and can be challenging with unstructured data. So how are you going to let me empower me to go in and pull out um, Slack messages that contain a data subjects um, PII and, and what capabilities do I have to mask or redact non-responsive PII or proprietary information in that unstructured data? Because it often sweeps in lots and lots and lots of other um, topics and data. Um, so make sure you have a good understanding of, of what the vendor's capabilities are there, but um, overall, just not something you can uh, you can afford to ignore. I know we're almost at time, Brandon. Anything to add there? Uh, I don't think so. I I, I think that's uh, absolutely right. I guess the only thing I'd say is like from a legal perspective, as you're building your data mapping solution and your data uh, visibility uh, process, you shouldn't assume that this sort of unstructured data or this long tail of messy information is the exception. You should anticipate that it is going to be a core part of your data footprint. Um, and it's going to be subject to uh, you know, these, these new regulations, particularly you mentioned um, uh, the removal of the employee exception under CCPA. Um, uh, there's a lot of unstructured data that is triggered based off of that. And so you should assume you're going to have to figure out a way to know where that data is and know how to govern it. Great. Okay, cool. Thanks, Sean and Brandon. Thanks, um, everyone, for joining and submitting questions and participating in this really dynamic discussion. Um, before we sign off, we wanted to extend an offer to those 
interested in learning more about how Transcend can help solve issues that we've talked about today and enable more data visibility efficiently to build this strong foundation for effective data governance. That includes you know, giving companies a continuous view beyond the data system layer, classifying data at the data point level, supporting custom data types and unstructured data too. So for registrants of today's webinar, if you take a meeting with the Transcend team before the end of the month, we'll send you a $50 US Amazon gift card or the equivalent in your local currency if you're not um, US based. No action required here. Our team will be in touch in the next couple of days. Just respond to that email and jump on a call with us before the end of the month to be eligible. Um, but wanted to just extend that offer to everyone who joined us here today. Again, thank you for joining, um, participating. Thank you, Sean and Brandon and IEPP for um, setting this up and, and hosting such a lively, dynamic discussion. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much to Phyllis, Sean, and Brandon for that really great discussion. And we also want to give a big thank you to Transcend for sponsoring today's program so that it's free to our audience. Lastly, I do want to encourage you to click the survey link that was put in the chat and just briefly give us your feedback on today's program. Um, it really helps us improve our web conference programming, so we certainly appreciate that. So with that, that wraps up the program here today. Thank you all so much for joining us, and we hope to see you at another IAPP web conference soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.